The United States carried out a daring airstrike on the enemy city, heralding impending events. Just four months after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, President Franklin D. Roosevelt was extremely concerned in the months preceding Doolittle's raiders gathering to retaliate against Tokyo. The United States had been defeated repeatedly since December 7, 1941, the day of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Aside from the Pacific Fleet's near total destruction at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese had also taken control of American outposts at Wake Island and Guam. The valiant American Filipino defense of the Philippines was rapidly collapsing, and there didn't seem to be any way to halt their onslaught toward America's west coast, with the British and Dutch armed forces either destroyed or driven out of the Far East. America's allies were powerless. There was never a triumph to show the terrified citizens of the United States, much to the dismay of General George C. Marshall, his Army Chief of Staff. President Roosevelt had great pleasure in the United States Navy, having served as an Assistant Secretary of the Navy at one point in his career. The President was concerned that the enemy was making steady inroads and that his Navy was doing nothing to stop them. The Navy had been ordered to engage the Japanese, but after only a few hours of searching for the enemy, the Navy had turned back. According to FDR, during a visit by British Prime Minister Winston S. Churchill to the White House, Admiral Ernest J. King was given overall command of the Navy and Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz was given command of the Pacific Fleet as a result of Roosevelt's discontent with the Navy High Command. Only a few hit-and-run operations on Japanese outposts in the Central Pacific could be carried out by the Navy, even then. These would be insufficient. Within the Roosevelt administration, there was a growing sense that the people of the United States wanted something more, something spectacular, an attack on the enemy that would provide the impression of victory even though it had no strategic purpose. Roosevelt, ever since Pearl Harbor, has been hoping for just such an attack. He had questioned Lieutenant Gen. Henry H. Arnold, the Chief of Staff of the Army Air Force, shortly after Japan's surprise raid. Hap, Arnold, if a bombing operation against the Japanese mainland was a possibility. It was General Arnold's responsibility to look into the possibilities and devise a plan for carrying out a raid of that kind. However, American planes were soon unable to launch such a raid from any Pacific sites due to the Japanese's quick progress. The president kept looking for opportunities. He inquired of Admiral King whether bombers of the United States Army Air Forces could depart from aircraft carriers. Captain Francis C. Lowe, the operations officer for Admiral King, thought it was feasible and gave the order to test his theory. The first special aviation project, also referred to as the Doolittle Raid, was thus born. Captain Lowe had just returned from a visit to the Virginian Norfolk Naval Base. He had noticed something there that caught his attention. On the ground, an outline of an aircraft carrier's deck was painted by Army pilots conducting bombing flights. Of course, the plan was to have Army pilots ready to strike enemy aircraft carriers. Navy pilots were also trained for carrier landings and takeoffs using this template. However, Captain Lowe noticed another thing. He pondered, it seems to me that a few of the Army's twin-engine bombers could be loaded on a carrier and used to bomb Japan if they have some bombers with a range longer than our Navy fighters. Not a pilot, but a submarine officer, Captain Lowe waited nervously as his commander who wasn't exactly known for his easygoing demeanor, considered it. Admiral King, to his astonishment, countered, You might have something there, Low. In the morning, discuss it with Duncan. Duncan was Captain Donald B. Duncan, an experienced pilot and Admiral King's air operations officer. And don't tell anyone else about this. The following day, January 11, 1942, Lowe and Duncan talked about the concept. They concluded that there were two major concerns that needed to be addressed. Could a medium bomber from the Army Air Forces land on an aircraft carrier 
and could it take off with a substantial payload of bombs and fuel. Graduate of the Naval Academy in 1917, Donald B. Duncan realized right away that an Army bomber could never land on an aircraft carrier. The jet was just too big to land on the deck, and even if it could, the elevators on the carrier were too narrow to get the plane down below decks. Additionally, the Army aircraft's tails lacked the strength to withstand the force of the aircraft carrier's arresting gear. Duncan was unsure, though, if those bombers could actually take off from a ship. Duncan started looking up the solution right away. He investigated historical documents for any information, reviewed Army aircraft manuals, and looked through records to discover if Army aircraft had ever taken off from an aircraft carrier. After five days, he submitted a handwritten 30-page report in which he concluded that the North American B-25 Mitchell medium bomber was the only bomber aircraft that could theoretically take off from an aircraft carrier. The B-25 was named for Army Air Service Brig. Jen William Lindrum Billy Mitchell, who defied military doctrine and custom by arguing that aircraft should be used to attack enemy battleships rather than capital ships. Mitchell was court-martialed in 1925 for his insubordination. The B-25 was also thought to be the most maneuverable bomber. During combat, it was stable but nimble enough to let the pilot focus on what was happening outside the aircraft. It was first used by the Army Air Forces in 1940, and throughout the conflict, it underwent eight official and numerous unofficial modifications. The B-25 was equipped with two Wright R-2600-29 double cyclone 14-cylinder radial 1,850 horsepower engines, which allowed it to reach a service ceiling of 24,000 feet and a top speed of 275 miles per hour. Its range was also 1,500 miles. As the war progressed, it was progressively armed with more machine guns and, for a brief period, a 75 mm cannon installed in the forward nose to strafe enemy bases. It had a crew of five and was smaller than the B-17 Flying Fortress and B-24 Liberator. Working with General Arnold, Captain Lowe saw that he shared Admiral King's eagerness to fulfill the President's request. Having resolved the aircraft issue, the first Special Aviation Project's commanding officer needed to be identified. James Harold Doolittle was the man chosen. He was short and balding. On December 14, 1896, in Alameda, California, he was born. He joined the Army Reserve as a student at the University of California, and by 1920, he had received a command in the Signal Corps Aviation Division. Lieutenant Doolittle taught flying. During World War I, he became known as a notable flyer in 1922 after completing the first transcontinental flight in less than a day. He quit the service to work in the commercial sector in 1930 after growing disenchanted with flying for the military. In his civilian life, Doolittle worked as a test pilot, jumping from several aircraft and experiencing multiple crashes. He was also the recipient of the prestigious Thompson Racing Trophy. Doolittle was not only a daredevil, though. In between air races and disasters, he was among the first people to graduate from the esteemed Massachusetts Institute of Technology with a degree in aeronautical sciences. As a result, he developed high-octane fuel, which would prove crucial in the impending conflict. However, in July 1940, he rejoined the Army Air Forces due to the impending outbreak of a new world war. Having spent 10 years with the Shell Oil Company, he was working under General Arnold as a lieutenant colonel by the next year. Doolittle was called into the general's office early 1 January 1942 and given a briefing on the possibility of Army bombers taking off from Navy carriers to destroy Japan. Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle went to his office and looked over the question, asking for time to go about the idea. He, too, concluded that the B-25 medium bomber, when suitably upgraded, was the sole feasible aircraft. When he got back to General Arnold's office, he gave his results. 
Dolittle offered to help when Arnold inquired if he knew someone who could plan such an event. The strategy was being prepared for execution by the Navy as well. The U.S. Hornet was determined to be the most suitable aircraft carrier to initiate the raid. It was intended that some experimental B-25 flights could be made from her decks, as the Hornet was set to arrive on the East Coast following her operations in the Pacific. Captain Duncan, in the meantime, took off for Hawaii in order to assemble the task group that would lead the first special aviation project into combat. There was no way to overcome the difficult issue of landing returning bombers on aircraft carriers. However, a solution soon emerged. If Doolittle's B-25s could land in China after attacking Japan, they would avoid having to return. This also resolved another issue. The Navy's task force, which at the moment represented the last American naval presence in the Pacific, had to return as soon as possible after coming perilously close to Japan to launch the bombers. The covert nature of the bombing operation was so great that during a meeting with the President on January 28, 1942, the Chiefs of Staff, some of whom were unaware of the scheme, made no mention of it whatsoever, limiting their discussion to the topic of bombing Japan from Chinese bases. Roosevelt persisted in calling for an early bombing of Japan proper, but he was not made aware of the plan until much later in the year. In the meantime, Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle left for Ohio's right field to start getting ready for his new position. Simultaneously, Captain Duncan took a plane to Norfolk, Virginia, to inform U.S. Hornet's captain, Captain Mark A. Mitcher, that three B-25s would be brought on board to practice carrier takeoffs. Future Admiral Captain Mitcher knows better than to inquire. First, Lieutenant John F. Fitzgerald was in charge of the three B-25s that were to be deployed aboard the Hornet. The crew of each plane consisted of a pilot and a co-pilot who had trained for a few days on the same Norfolk simulated field that Captain Lowe had seen several weeks prior. Before the testing began, one of these B-25s experienced an engine failure. After the other two were hauled on board the Hornet, Captain Duncan and Captain Mitcher talked over the specifics of the trial without disclosing the mission's objective. As a former Navy pilot, Mitcher was aware of the dangers. On February 2, the carrier sailed out of sight of shore from Norfolk the following day. Lieutenant Fitzgerald and Lieutenant James F. McCarthy, who were flying two B-25s, gave the order to staff their aircraft. Fitzgerald subsequently recalled that he was taken aback to see that he had roughly 500 feet of useful deck space available, and that, with the brakes fully applied and the engine revving up, his plane just needed a score more miles of velocity to take off. The takeoff proceeded unexpectedly well, and Fitzgerald took off with plenty of room to spare. McCarthy took off without any issues without a clue as to why they had just put their lives in danger. The two pilots returned to Norfolk. The flying trial had gone well, but there were still unanswered questions. Neither of the two aircraft carried any bombs or additional fuel tanks, and they only carried two crew members instead of the usual five. Nevertheless, Captain Duncan was confident that a B-25, fully manned and loaded, could launch from an aircraft carrier in the ocean. As long as the carrier was traveling against the wind at a speed greater than 20 knots, Doolittle agreed with Duncan. There was significant uncertainty, nevertheless, as to whether the carrier would have adequate deck space to successfully launch those same bombers while carrying 20 B-25s. Doolittle was kept busy figuring out what changes would have to be made in order for the bombers to take off from the carriers, land in Japan, and then take off for China. He estimated the size and quantity of additional fuel tanks that would need to be added in each bomber and created drawings of those alterations for the right field engineers to review. Then, without disclosing the rationale behind his requests, he met with Brig, Jen, George C. Kenney, who would go on to command the 5th Army Air Force in the Southwest Pacific, to outline his requirements for what he called the Special B-25B Project. 
a significant amount of new equipment was required, such as new bomb shackles for the modified bomb load and new plumbing to accommodate the extra fuel tanks. The largest issue turned out to be the fuel tanks. Eventually, the McQuay company made a unique 265-gallon steel tank, but it had issues and was quickly replaced by a 225-gallon tank made by the United States Rubber Company of Mishawaka, Indiana. However, issues persisted. Usually at the joints where the tanks and lines joined, the tanks leaked. Most, but not all, of these issues were resolved by repairs. An additional 160-gallon tank was positioned above the bomb bay. Once more, leaks were an issue and increased the chance of fire, but repairs and improvements brought the risk down to manageable levels. The lower gun turret was taken out and replaced with a 60-gallon tank that would be filled from 10 5-gallon gasoline tanks carried in the rear compartment by a gunner during flight. Each aircraft would carry a total of 1,141 gallons, 9,527 pounds of fuel, of which 1,100 would be available. The planes were accepted with these remaining issues and flown off to Florida under extreme time limitations. Doolittle then required targets. For this, he went to General Arnold's deputy for intelligence, Brig, Jen Carl, Tui, Spates. He requested the target folders for Japan's most significant industrial targets. Once more, he did not explain his desire for these, and General Spates, who subsequently led the U.S. Europe's strategic air forces, did not inquire. There were 10 of these targets available, Tokyo, Yokohama, Ko, Nagoya, and six other minor cities were among them. The real targets were refineries that processed gasoline, shipbuilding facilities, and companies that produced iron, steel, magnesium, and aluminum. The president continued to push for action against Japan directly from Washington. He was always asking Admiral King and General Arnold about a strategy to attack the center of Japan. At this point, he was intrigued by the notion of using heavy bombers that were taking off from Mongolia to attack Japan. General Arnold clarified that heavy bombers could not operate out of Mongolia without the Soviet Union's approval, as the Soviet Union was at the time a neutral in the Pacific War. Without mentioning the Doolittle Project, Arnold added that the greatest option was to base bombers in China and attack Japan from there. That initiative was starting to move forward. After figuring out the project's mechanics as best he could, Doolittle turned his attention to the issue of staffing. His deadline of April 1, 1942, he wanted crews that had received training. He took a seat, as was customary, and scribbled a note to himself outlining his requirements for the impending attack. This document, titled B-25 Special Project, contained his goals and prerequisites for accomplishment. He wrote, the goal of this special project is to bomb and fire Japan's industrial center. The plan called for the planes to fly to their targets by following rivers or other landmarks, and the objective was to bring carrier-borne bombers to within 400 to 500 miles of the coast of Japan, preferably to the southeast. There was going to be simultaneous bombing. Following the bombing, the aircraft were to take off for Chinese airfields located inland from the Chinese coast and free of Japanese occupation, such as Chuchao, Lishui, Yushin, or Chino. The planes were to land in Chungking, a major Chinese airstrip located 800 miles inland, after refueling. They would then proceed to the specified location after that. Any aircraft would have to go a maximum of 2,000 miles nonstop, there would be 24 B-25s, six of which would be spares in case something went wrong with another aircraft. Up to 1,000 pounds of incendiaries and two 500-pound bombs were carried by each bomber. The crew would consist of a pilot, co-pilot, radio operator, bombardier navigator, and gunner mechanic. The only volunteers who would be accepted were those who had flown a B-25B. There would be a capable meteorologist and an accomplished navigator on the team. Volunteers who spoke Chinese were much sought after, 
which Army Air Force's units were currently operating the B-25B bomber, DeLittle inquired. He discovered that this version was already being flown at Pendleton, Oregon, by the 34th, 37th, and 95th squadrons of the 17th Bombardment Group, and the 89th Reconnaissance Squadron was as well. He received orders to move all of these squadrons' aircraft and staff from Pendleton to Columbia Army Air Base in Columbia, North Carolina. Without providing specifics, word spread that volunteers were sought for, a very dangerous operation. The Doolittle designed fuel tanks were placed on the B-25Bs as they were traveling to Columbia. Similar to the project, training had to be kept under wraps. The panhandle of Florida's Eaglin Airfield was chosen. In addition to its solitude, Eaglin's proximity to the Gulf of Mexico would give the volunteers experience in overwater navigation, a crucial component of the upcoming project. Doolittle needed a competent executive officer because his time was split between Wright Field, Washington, D.C., and Eglin Field. He decided on Major John A. Jack Hilger, the 89th Reconnaissance Squadron Commander. Hilger would assemble the aircraft, arrange up the Eglin Field training, procedures, and prepare the squad for the mission. Although all three of the 17 Bombardment Group's squadron commanders offered their services, Lieutenant Colonel William C. Mills, the group commander, was only able to release Captain Edward J. Ski York underwent a transfer. Almost every member of the flight crew volunteered, and there was a common spirit among them. The three commanders of the squadron were to decide who was accepted. Before long, enough ground crews, mechanics, armorers, and radio operators were named, and 24 crews were assigned. It was instructed that these guys report at Eglin Field. Although Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle had never been qualified to fly a medium bomber, he was set to command a flight of B-25B bombers to Japan. In order to qualify on the B-25B, he temporarily relinquished his P-40 fighter aircraft in order to remedy this issue. After crews and aircraft were chosen and eventually assembled at Eglin Field, Doolittle told Major Hilder about the mission's goal and procedures so that he might comprehend the significance of the training he would soon be in charge of. Hilder proposed that a Navy flying officer be assigned to the training program because the Army Air Forces were not very familiar with American customs. Navy. Thinking along similar lines, Captain Duncan had assigned a young Navy pilot, Lieutenant Henry L., later Rear Admiral, Miller, Hank, his involvement in the expedition would turn out to be extremely beneficial. When Lieutenant Miller arrived, the crews became even more disoriented. He explained that his purpose was to instruct them on how to take off from an aircraft carrier when asked why he was there. When he mentioned that he had never flown a B-25B before, they were even more shocked. He swiftly fixed this by flying the bomber multiple times. After becoming acquainted with the aircraft, Miller trained the squadron leaders in carrier takeoffs using a little auxiliary field. Despite their skepticism, the Army pilots were open to learning. They were soon taking off at a speed of 350 feet in a 40-knot wind carrying a payload of 31,000 pounds, which was 2,000 pounds more than the aircraft's statutory weight restrictions. Doolittle quickly assembled his squadron. Major Henry Johnson served as his adjutant, Captain Ski York as his operations officer, and Major Hilger as his executive officer. As things started to come together, the personnel was gradually informed about the goals, strategies, and operations of the operation they were being trained for. Preserving secrecy remained paramount. Having put in so much effort to plan the operation, Doolittle was determined to take the helm and enrolled in Miller's training program. Army pilots, who were taught to use as much takeoff ground as possible, were astonished to hear that their airspeed increase was limited to the length of a football field minus 50 miles per hour, to use the Navy's terminology. However, they quickly picked up the necessary takeoff speed and runway length. 
Doolittle desired that his pilots become accustomed to flying in both daylight and night conditions, as well as over land and water. He set a goal of 50 hours of flying time. However, this was rarely accomplished due to ongoing repairs and alterations to the aircraft. That's when another issue started to emerge. Certain guns on board the aircraft had to be removed because they were already carrying more than their authorized payload. However, that just made an attack more likely. Answer was devised by the squadron's gunnery officer, Captain C. Ross Greening. The tail section's cannons would be replaced with black painted broomsticks in the hopes that the sight of the fake barrels would deter Japanese fighters. The next issue was the American bomber's use of the top-secret Norden bombsite. This top-secret bombsite could not be compromised by adversaries. However, they had no use for it as the bombers were going to bomb by sight and fly low over Japan to avoid detection. Thus, they were taken off all the planes. It was replaced by a handmade bombsite that cost about 20 cents and was constructed from two pieces of metal. The bombardiers discovered that, in fact, it performed far better than the Norden site at low altitudes. Additionally, Captain Greening recommended eliminating the electrically operated lower gun turrets, which were a continual source of trouble. When Doolittle nodded, the turrets were taken down. It was later discovered that nearly all of the gunners had no prior experience firing a machine gun from an airplane. Even worse, the squadron's machine guns were mostly unusable. As it happened, the guns were not completed when they were sent to the squadron. To solve that issue, an ordnance expert from Wright Field had to be consulted. However, the delay meant that the gunners could only rehearse ground firing instead of aerial combat. Incendiary bombs were what Doolittle had asked for for his next mission. He received 500-pound bursts of incendiaries from Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland, which dispersed as they fell and covered a larger area. However, the delivered demolition bombs would not come loose from the aircraft's bomb racks. Even though this issue was ultimately fixed, training and practice times were lost. A doctor was something the squadron lacked at the time. When Dr. First Lieutenant Thomas R. White a doctor attached to the 89th Reconnaissance Squadron offered to take on the role. The issue was handled on its own. However, the planes were too small to accommodate a doctor. In order to serve as a doctor without requiring any non-flying people, White offered to train to be a gunner on one of the bombers. Not only did he qualify, but he also finished second out of all the gunners on the firing range. He had a crew assigned to him. Doolittle had a personal matter to attend to immediately. Having avoided battle in the First World War, he had made no secret of his determination to engage in the current conflict. He met with General Arnold in March and gave him an update on the project's development. After the briefing, he requested authorization to assume command of the squadron and lead it into the Japan raid. Arnold declined stating that he needed Doolittle on his Washington staff. The resolute lieutenant colonel started a tirade to take control of the project he had spent three months creating because he would not take no for an answer. Eventually, his argument worked, and he was given command of the group that would soon be known as Doolittle's Raiders. Doolittle returned to training, racing back to Eaglin Field to stop General Arnold from altering his mind. Doolittle volunteered to take over as the pilot in case one of the others fell unwell. First Lieutenant Richard E. Cole, co-pilot. First Lieutenant Henry A. Potler, navigator. Bombardier Surgeon Fred A. Bramer and Engineer Gunner Surgeon Paul J. Leonard would make up his crew. The U.S. Hornet was prepared to accept the planes and pilots for the operation. When Admiral King sent General Arnold a letter in the third week of March that said, Tail Jim am I to G on his horse. Arnold called Doolittle with the information. Training and maintenance continued until that point. Paradoxically, prior to boarding the Hornet, pilots and aircraft were told to report to Doolittle's hometown of Alameda, California. Only 22 planes remained to take off at this point, 
the rest having been destroyed during practice takeoffs. Issues were still coming up at the time of leaving. The aircraft were to be tested to make sure every plane operated as intended while they awaited loading at McClellan Army Airfield in California. Doolittle personally informed the base commander that certain tests should not be carried out and that Doolittle was satisfied with the carburetor's adjustment at Eglin Field. Thus, certain tests should not be carried out. But the tests and repairs were put off because McClellan Field staff members were still following their peacetime schedule. Captain Ted W. Lawson, one of the pilots, recalled, I had to watch while one of the mechanics revved my engine so quickly that the new blades picked up dirt and got pockmarked on their tips. It would take another phone call to General Arnold to resolve these most recent issues. I saw another one attempting to sandpaper the flaws away and scolded at him until he took some oil and rubbed it on the places he had just sandpapered. The aircraft were then transferred to Alameda Naval Air Station in San Francisco Bay, California, even though many of their issues remained unsolved. Doolittle and Captain York greeted them and asked each crew member whether there had been any issues during the McClellan trip. When a crew reported issues, they were told to park their aircraft in a certain spot. Those planes would not come back. Subsequently, Doolittle gave the orders for those crews to join the Hornet so they could act as backup crew members. On April 1, 1942, the good planes were put onto the carrier exactly on time. Space on board the carrier presented Doolittle with its next challenge. Originally, he had planned to load 18 B-25Bs on board, but after talking with Navy personnel, it was discovered that only 15 would fit and yet provide enough deck space for takeoff. Still, 16 B-25s were carried on board. Doolittle, worried that some of his troops might still be afraid to fly off a carrier, said that the 16th bomber would be flown off to prove the viability of the idea after the Hornet left the naval station and traveled roughly 100 miles out to sea. Lieutenant Hank Wilson would assist two spare pilots in flying off this 16th B-25B. The U.S. Hornet was launched in 1940 as the second aircraft carrier in the Enterprise class. It carried 20,000 tons of cargo, could accommodate up to 100 fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo bombers, and had a crew of little over 2,000 officers and sailors. Typically, the ship's strength came from the 80 to 85 planes on average that it carried. Now, however, the Hornet was helpless, her deck packed with army bombers, and all its own aircraft hidden below decks. Under Vice Admiral William F. Allen's leadership, it would sail as part of Task Force 16.2 to safeguard the mission and the carrier. Bull Halsey, Junior Task Force 16.2 comprised two destroyer divisions under the command of Captain Richard L. Connolly, commander of Destroyer Squadron 6, Desmond 6, four cruisers under the command of Rear Admiral Raymond A. Spruance and the carrier U.S. Enterprise, commanded by Captain George D. Murray, USN. Commander Houston L. Maples would command two Navy oilers that would travel with the task force a portion of the way in order to supply enough gasoline for the return trip. On April 16, early in the morning, the Hornet joined Task Force 16.2, which was stationed between Midway and the Aleutians. After TS-16.2 refueled from the two oilers the following day, it had gone to within a thousand miles of Tokyo. It then left the oilers and destroyers behind and raced toward Japan. Unbeknownst to Doolittle, the Chinese fields where he planned to land and refuel had not been prepared for his arrival due to inclement weather. It was already determined that the B-25Bs would need to launch from the Hornet within 500 miles of the Japanese coast in order to reach the Chinese airfields following the bombing of Japan. On April 18, Admiral Halsey intended to conduct a night strike at that range. Tokyo would be hit by 13 planes, and three more would hit Nagoya, Osaka, and Kobe. Doolittle's aircraft would take the lead and target Tokyo with incendiaries.
illuminating the path for the other aircraft. Doolittle's jet carried four firebombs, while the other planes carried three 500-pound bombs and one incendiary bomb. The projected damage would be small, even if they managed to approach and bomb their targets. However, the American people's spirit would soar, and the Japanese, who had assumed they were immune, would be shocked. But the Japanese had put a monkey wrench into the arrangement. They had set up a picket line of tiny ships way east of their own shoreline, and the Americans were unaware of it. About 700 miles from the enemy coast, contacts were detected by the leading ship's radar during the dark morning of April 18. To avoid the contact, TS-16.2 changed its path. Scout planes from the Enterprise were sent out ahead of the task force to search as daylight broke. They said that they believed the Japanese had also observed them when they sighted a picket boat just before 6 in the morning. Subsequently, an additional vessel was observed, and Japanese radio signals were detected, signifying that Japan was being informed of the task force's existence. One of the cruisers, U.S. Nashville, sank the picket boat while also rescuing survivors, but details were leaked. Admiral Halsey was out of surprise and faced two options. Knowing they would be 150 miles short of reaching the Chinese airfields, he had two options, launch the planes or give up. Doolittle conferred, and it was decided to launch the army bombers right then and there. Send Doolittle a message saying, launch planes. God bless you and good luck to Colonel Doolittle and gallant command. Approximately 623 miles off the coast of Japan and 668 miles from Tokyo, the first plane, piloted by Doolittle, took off at 8.3 a.m. after the Hornet's skipper swung her into the wind. Many onlookers feared that the planes would not be able to take off because of the heavy wind and choppy sea. Despite the near miss, all 16 aircraft managed to successfully take off at intervals of three minutes, with the Hornet's 20 knots of speed and the additional 30 knots of wind helping them along the way. Now, instead of a covert night attack within a predetermined flying range, it was a daytime strike against a wary opponent with minimal chance of a successful landing at the end of the mission. At 8.54 a.m., the final aircraft took off, and Mitscher quickly altered the Hornet's trajectory to return home. It was just the 80 Dolittle Raiders and themselves. As intended, the plane passed over the Pacific at a low altitude of only 200 feet over the waves. The gunners kept a constant eye on the fuel gauges and filled the third tank as needed, while the pilots and co-pilots alternated at the controls. Everyone was concerned about fuel use since they knew they wouldn't have enough to go to the authorized Chinese airfields. Crash landing or ditching at sea were the only possibilities. None of the Japanese that the crews encountered seemed to care that several of them flew over or near Japanese warships during the journey. And Doolittle's plane flew directly under an enemy flying boat that just loomed at us suddenly out of the mist. The pilots turned toward their respective targets after crossing the hostile coast. Once more, numerous enemy aircraft were observed, but none appeared to detect them. Additionally, no anti-aircraft fire was directed towards the trespassers. One reason was that the American planes were mistakenly considered by the military and people to be Japanese, as Tokyo was coincidentally hosting an air raid drill. The Japanese military hierarchy's unwavering confidence was the other factor. They could not have imagined the hated Americans attacking Japan. The Japanese 26th Air Flotilla, tasked with securing the eastern air and sea approaches to the home islands, remained vigilant despite the picket boat's warnings. Additionally, warships were manned and ready for any assault. Strangely enough, though, Tokyo failed to warn its 8 million citizens of the approaching assault force. The plane, headed for Tokyo, was flying at treetop level over the terrain. A number of Japanese warplanes passed in the opposite way, without straying from formation or demonstrating any awareness that the Americans were present. The people on the ground waved to us, and it seemed everyone was playing baseball. Doolittle's co-pilot Dick Cole subsequently reported, 
Doolittle elevated his jet to 1,200 feet and got ready to deliver his bombs as he approached his objective from the north. It was 12.30 p.m. Tokyo time when Doolittle's incendiaries, likely the first ever drop on Tokyo, went off. 128 four-pound bomblets, intended to disperse over a large region, were contained in each bomb. After removing his bombs, Doolittle lowered himself back to the minimal height and made his way toward the ocean. Doolittle, fearing the consequences should any of his troops be captured, had severely forbade any machine gun strafing or bombing of the Imperial Palace, in spite of his men's wishes. In terms of casualties and damage, this bombing raid was insignificant. Only roughly 50 houses and shops, along with two schools and a hospital, were destroyed by Doolittle's planes, bombs. Nineteen were injured and two bystanders died. Subsequently, 31 unexploded bomblets were discovered and extracted. Anti-aircraft fire rushed up to pepper the sky as Doolittle proceeded west and then south, away from the burning structures below. The planes behind him had to brave the incoming explosives. Compared to Doolittle's incendiaries, the other raiders' high explosive bombs caused significantly greater damage. More citizens perished as more structures, including multiple steelworks, were struck. The latter bombers had just escaped being shot down when Japanese fighters suddenly took to the air and began following them. The escape had proven to be far more challenging than the initial attack. Doolittle's jet was among those that encountered severe headwinds, which severely limited the plane's range and gasoline supply. The same outcomes happened to those who experienced terrible weather. However, all 16 aircraft exited Japanese airspace after successfully bombing their targets. Some did so despite opposition from fighters and anti-aircraft guns, while others encountered none at all. The aircraft were heading for China. Everybody was looking for some indication that a field was ready for them to land in. Nobody discovered any. After a while, 15 of the aircraft were forced to crash land, forcing the remaining crews to escape by a parachute. Doolittle's aircraft, 402344, continued to fly until it was powered by fumes. Doolittle and the crew made the decision to parachute to safety rather than crash land in the dark over unknown territory. After 13 hours of flight, they still didn't know where they were or if the area below was controlled by the enemy or by friends. This was my third parachute jump to save my hide, Doolittle recalled. I could only wait till I reached the ground because I could not see anything below. My ankles, which I had fractured in South America in 1926, were my worry as I floated down. I bowed to absorb the shock racing myself for a potentially violent collision with the ground. There wasn't much of an impact when I hit. After landing in a rice paddy, I slumped into a somewhat scented concoction of water and night soil. He attempted to get in touch with friendly Chinese citizens after landing close to Kuzao, and after a few mishaps, he eventually found some who pointed him in the direction of Chinese military personnel nearby. For the majority of the mission, First Lieutenant Travis Hoover, 402292, led his crew behind Doolittle. He chose a belly landing that resulted in minimal injuries in a Chinese rice paddy close to Ningbo. Friendly guerrillas saved the men and helped them get to safety. First Lieutenant Robert M. oversaw crew number three, number 402270 in Whiskey Peat. Bob Gray. They flew into some anti aircraft fire. After bombing dockyards, but they avoided being struck. They landed over China and aborted southeast of Kuzhao. Corporal Leland D. Factor, the gunner, was killed in the jump, and Lieutenant Charles J. Ozuk, the navigator, was hurt. The other four survivors were transported to safety by friendly Chinese. Lieutenant First Everett W. as enemy fighter planes attacked. Brick Holstrom led crew number four, 402282 to Tokyo. With only one machine gun operational, they were forced to dump their bombs into Tokyo Bay. After eluding the combatants, they bailed out over Shangrao and were escorted to safety by bystanders. Captain David M. led the 5th Bomber, 
forty twenty two eighty three jones davy since the carrier was in battle condition and had cut off all fuel lines the crew's attempt to top off the gas tanks had failed causing issues from the moment of departure they bombed a manufacturing facility a power plant and an oil storage tank before they jumped out over kuzhau and were rescued plane number six the green hornet number forty twenty two ninety eight flown by first lieutenant dean e hallmark had the unluckiest crew they flew toward china after bombing a steel industry in northeast tokyo but they ran out of patrol there so hallmark made the decision to dump his jet on the beach close to wenchow sergeant donald e fitzmorris and corporal william j dieter drowned during the difficult landing all three of the survivors hallmark navigator lieutenant chase j nielsen and co-pilot lieutenant robert j metter were hurt the casualties were buried by helpful chinese but those who survived were later captured by the japanese and held as prisoners of war for years subjected to severe beatings and torture thirty seconds over tokyo a best-selling book was written by captain ted w lawson who flew bomber number no. seven ruptured duck number no. forty twenty two sixty one this crew was severely injured when they ditched on the chinese shore after bombing factories in tokyo all made it back to the united states safely thanks to chinese citizens it's interesting to note that captain lawson's life was spared due to the amputation of his infected leg by lieutenant white the former doctor who became a gunner aboard aircraft fifteen eighth plane forty twenty two forty two piloted by captain edward j the operations officer of the squadron ski york had engine problems that resulted in more fuel being used than anticipated he had to decide what to do once his bomb load was depleted it was impossible for him to land in japan and he could not reach the shore of china york entered a field close to vladivostok after traveling toward the soviet union against orders to the contrary before making their escape to iran the crew and aircraft were detained for fourteen months lieutenant colonel robert cole doolittle's co-pilot and surviving raid veteran piloting a b-25 over eglin air force base florida in two thousand and eight as part of a u s day of recreation of the doolittle raiders training first lieutenant harold f after bombing the tokyo gas and electric company doc watson's plane nine whirling dervish forty twenty three o three bailed out above nanchang where they were saved first lieutenant richard o was in charge of the tenth aircraft forty twenty two fifty dick joyce who carry out bombs on a precise instrument plant and the japan special steel company they jumped out safely near kuzao escaping unharmed despite anti-aircraft fire crew number eleven hari carrier number forty twenty two forty nine was commanded by captain c ross greening the gunnery officer for the squadron following their bombardment of warehouses oil refineries and ports enemy fighter jets attacked them the gunner thought he had shot down one of the pursuing aircraft additionally they managed to flee and bailed out over kuzhau where they were saved under first lieutenant william m baker plane number twelve fickle finger of fate forty twenty two seventy eight bower bill when it initially flew close to a group of adversary fighters it escaped attack the crew then discovered that the yokohama dockyards their main objective were shielded by barrage balloons they detonated two explosives against factories a big warehouse and the algura refinery after arriving in china they abandoned ship close to kuzhau battalion sergeant waldo j bither one of the bowers crew members had a near accident his parachute hooked on something and opened inside the aircraft as he was getting ready to jump out it turned out that sergeant bither was the only man on the doolittle raid with parachute packing experience he completed this swiftly and leaped successfully pilot first lieutenant edgar e mcelroy was unaffected by being number thirteen the avenger 
forty twenty two forty seven this crew proceeded to china and bailed out close to nanshang after bombing the dry docks and shipping in the harbor of yokohama they were brought to the city of poyang by chinese citizens where the thirty thousand residents hailed them as heroes major john a is the executive officer of the squadron plane number fourteen to forty twenty two ninety seven piloted by jack hilger destroyed the mitsubishi aircraft facility in nagoya they bailed out over china near shangrao much like the rest and were taken safely to join a number of other crews number fifteen tnt number forty twenty two sixty seven was flown by first lieutenant donald g smith with lieutenant doc thomas r white acting as his gunner this crew chose to abandon ship in the water and they all made it out alive when the raft capsized dr white's medical kit was the main item lost after eluding japanese patrols and being picked up by a chinese boat known as the junk they landed in chuchow where dr white discovered captain lawson's predicament and came to his help another unfortunate ship was plane number sixteen also known as bat out of hell number forty twenty two sixty eight led by first lieutenant william g bill farrow a sailor on board the hornet was hurt when he slipped beneath a propeller and had his arms severed during takeoff farrow's aircraft was targeted by enemy fighters in nagoya where it was intended to land they battled a weather front when they arrived near the chinese coast in the dark they recognized the city below as nanchang which is known to be in enemy hands when a hole in the clouds opened up but they had run out of gas and had no choice following their escape near ningbo they were apprehended and akin to the crew of aircraft six endured continuous torture at the hands of the japanese until the conclusion of the conflict all eight of the guys who were taken prisoner on flights six and sixteen endured malnourishment solitary incarceration and unceasing beatings of the three inmates lieutenants william g hallmark dean e the japanese executed bill farrow and sergeant harold a spatz who was the bat out of hell dunner for war crimes the remaining four were starving malnourished and on the verge of death when the war ended the raids detractors claimed that nothing of military significance was accomplished and that the bomb damage was swiftly and simply fixed however they fail to recognize that the united states had boosted morale among both the military and civilian population by striking a blow to japan's core something that japanese military officials thought was impossible even for a little while the japanese seemed to have interrupted their winning streak the humiliation the raid inflicted on the senior japanese military leadership was a significant outcome for them the idea of an adversary that most of them detested bombing tokyo the residence of their revered emperor was inconceivable to reduce the impact of the raid on their civilian population they took extreme measures the raid's most significant outcome though was that it resolved the conflict within the japanese high command the goal of the japanese naval general staff was to invade australia and sever its communications with the united states in order to carry out their campaign in the south pacific the head of the japanese combined fleet admiral isoruku yamamoto desired a major naval engagement to permanently remove the american navy from the conflict a victory would negate the united states ability to attack navy allow additional conquests and safeguard those that japan now possesses he was certain that this would be achieved by his scheme to trap the u s navy close to midway he made the valid point that other attacks of this nature might be anticipated claiming that the dull little raid could only have originated from what he called the keyhole at midway for japan then his plan to seize midway and destroy the u s pacific fleet was the only logical course of action after the dull little raid the midway operation became the top priority for the opposing japanese military leaders however at midway less than two months later the japanese fleet not the american fleet was almost destroyed 
mostly due to the valiant pilots of the first special aviation project who became proudly known as doolittle's raiders in april 1942 